Um, we're here with Dr. Hosni today. Hello, Doctor. How are you? Hi, hi, Dr. Sana. How are you keeping? I'm great. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you so um, much. Pleasure to meet you for the first time. Yeah, yourself as well. And I'm really excited because I'm never the one asking all the questions. So today should be very interesting. Um, yeah, that's very good. Uh, actually, all my patients have been asking me all week when the interview is going to be. So they're really looking forward to finding out more about your surgeries. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, so yeah. You know, like just like uh, I'm an eye surgeon anyway, like um, ophthalmic surgeon. So most of the surgery we do the uh, refractive surgeries, which is to connect the vision either on the cornea or on the length of the eye, and oculoplasty, which is uh, kind of related to. Uh, to your own subspeciality as well. That's what we're really interested in today. <laughs> um, so why don't you first of all tell us a bit about your background and how you became an ophthalmic surgeon? <laughs> that was, that, that, that's a very horrible story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a long story, I'd imagine. Yeah, after yeah. I graduated from Faculty of Medicine, as you know, like it's kind of very heavy study. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had three to four years of residency in Champs University and uh, after the residency during this you finish your master's degree then i became an assistant lecturer and specialist uh, we call it specialist but anyway assistant lecturer lecture and specialist then i finished my phd md frcs fellow of international council of ophthalmology and uh, what else and few other small stuff uh, in between so i become a lecturer and consultant in egypt of refractive surgeon um, then i decide just to um, to change the uh, the mood a little bit and go to Ireland and we started in Ireland in 2014. Okay, very good. It's a long time ago. Yeah, um, that's... Very good. And you've only started Instagram and TikTok recently, is that right? Yeah, I'm a beginner. I just like always take my information from my niece and nephew, so like I'm <laughs> still very much beginner. I was You're... starting just the maybe a YouTube channel that was before, very even recently. Yeah. Your videos are really, really good. They're really informative, um, and I'd recommend anyone who's watching to go watch them. Like, I mean, you do you cover like all of, all aspects of health and medicine, don't you? Yeah, that's right. Thank you so much for that. It won't be coming something beside your own great videos. Uh, thank but you. Uh, yeah, just the only thing that I like uh, teaching since since I I told you like I was in the university always. Mm -hmm. So I like teaching um, and the idea of simplifying the uh, hard science. So most of the videos is not my subspeciality, but in my belief, you are not treating uh, a disease like uh, I can assume I'm good in my part, but you treat the patient as a whole. So you should even have good idea about other problems, but you are not an expert in them. So at least you know where to ref when to refer the patient and where to refer the patient. Absolutely, so, you're right. Yeah, that's what like, I like your videos are really fun to watch as well. Um, for anyone to watch like even like if no matter what age you are or what your interests are they're really engaging yeah thank you so much you should write this in a paper i'll put it at the certificate <laughs> in my <laughs> so we got a lot of um questions and i have them written down next to me here so i don't forget any um the first one was what are the main procedures that you carry out in in, in a week it's mostly here like i don't do uh, the refractive surgery here in Ireland. i did a lot lots of refractive surgery back when I come to Ireland, mm -hmm. um, if we mean by the fact of the LASIK, uh, uh, because like there is no LASIK, uh, LASIK in Ireland is um, is kind of expensive and um, and there is no a lot of access. But there is very good places to do LASIK in Ireland anyway. But I'm not involved in this. Mm -hmm. And uh, we do cataract surgery, we do cornea surgery, we do eyelid surgery. Uh, sometimes every now and then we do squid surgery. We remove some uh, lumps and stuff. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's kind of busy. And besides, of course, the clinic and the on-call and the emergencies and the traumas and this kind of thing. Okay, very good. Um, just if anyone has any questions, they can pop them into the comments and we'll get to them at the end. Um, so let's get to what everyone is really interested in here. Um, can you tell us a little bit about blepharoplasties? Um, who should be getting it? What does the procedure involve? If you know a rough price, anything like that? Okay, so mostly blepharoplasty, uh, if we can yeah, we divide it into um, somebody who needs to do the blepharoplasty and somebody it's optional for her to do the, or him to do the blepharoplasty. Mm -hmm. Some people have something called dermatocalitis. Mm -hmm. Dermatocalitis is just the upper eyelid. With time, the eyelid becomes less elastic and the skin becomes redundant. 
and this could affect the eye in many conditions. It might make the eye a little bit droopy. Uh, it's different from the toes, actually, and the causes of the toes, which is the droopy eyelid, but it makes the eyelid shut down. It can um, maybe worse in the case of the dry eye, make a very bad feeling sensation, plus the cosmetic appearance. Mm -hmm. So sometimes people, the dermatocalysis is very low to the extent that affects the visual field. Like imagine you are driving the car or something and you have problems in seeing the periphery from this eyelid stuff. So this kind of indication that we can uh, uh, tell the patient that it's better to do this kind of surgery. Mm -hmm. The other kind of patient that they do it uh, just for the cosmetic and it, it completely we, uh, we appreciate that. But uh, it depends on them. I cannot tell somebody you should be looking better with the uh, with, with blef. I can't say like that. Like it's completely something up to him or her to say, I need to do that and I'm convinced to do that and I will do it. The only time that we we just say the uh, recommended for the people who really have problem with it. Okay, so you have medical reasons to get it done and you have cosmetic reasons to get it done. And when people ask me, like, I always have, um, the way I explain why people get droopy eyes in the first place is there's a few different things. You have um, like muscle issues, you have some muscles that get stronger that make your eyes heavier, um, you have skin laxity changes, you have like bone issues. From your point of view, um, people that get this condition that you talk about, is there any other contributing factor that causes it? Yeah, let's just uh, separate between the tosis mm -hmm. and the dermatocalysis. Dermatocalysis is purely a skin problem, maybe some fat problem that bulge the preceptal uh, fat. It just um, bulges and make this shape and make the uh, eyelid heavy. It's very different than tosis, which is real droopness of the lead margin mm -hmm. of the eye and this could be of many causes could be congenital could be due to neurological problems like the third nerve palsy for example could be something like a muscle problem like with age again the septum the uh, levator the muscle called the levator that le elevates the eyelid its own septum uh, its own um, uh, this muscle become weakened and the, the eye start to droop uh, down like this so these, these are other kind of surgeries to strengthen the muscle and stuff like this. But the dermatocalitis is mostly, uh, uh, yeah, due to age, aging stuff. And yeah. I find that it's quite common in the Irish population. You've practiced in places like Egypt. Do you find these kind of conditions are, or ptosis of the eye is common, you know, in other cultures or in other... Um... The, the dermatocalitis or the ptosis? The, the the excess skin that we need the to do prefer mm -hmm. um, I don't know like that we have of course but maybe um, maybe a lot of uh, people doesn't complain so much of it maybe something like this like uh, yeah, they find it part of the aging process but like it's everywhere it, we cannot say as long as you are getting older it, it's yeah, okay. Yeah. okay, let me look at these questions there. Um, so with the surgery, like what do you actually do for a blepharoplasty surgery? What's the procedure? Okay, it's a um, it's simple procedure. Like just we first should uh, take like do what we will remove of skin. Like we remove only skin, like we don't remove muscle. So okay. if you remove any of the muscle, it will affect the operation later on. So we remove only the skin the measurement is the most important thing part of the surgery so you have to measure well how much of the skin you will do it in the elliptical shape like this and be aware that you're removing all the skin sometimes we find occasionally the fat sometimes it's the median part of the eye the inner part of the eye the nasal part we find fat which is the preceptal fat and we need to remove it as well because uh, of course as you are expert in this kind of cosmetic stuff you find some ladies have some bulging or men bulging here area like this. This is kind of fat that needs to be removed in the during uh, the um, the blepharoplasty procedure, and it's easy to be done. Then we we'll stitch it again uh, in a cosmetic stitches, like uh, even interrupted suture. It, it, it gives good results as well, or something called subcuticular, like we just got, get stitched under the skin to make it look better. Here. Okay. And is there much downtime with the surgery? Like afterwards, what kind of downtime are we looking at? To for what for the people to uh, like recovery the after, after the surgery? Um, 
like of course they can do like maybe start to take the shower normally and stuff maybe after 10 days after three weeks we start them even to um, to um, enhance the patient to do the massage after to reduce the scar formation after okay and is there usually much scar formation like is that common or La, not common not okay. common some um, people actually have you know this kind of people who are uh, so much sensitive to keloids having keloids mm-hmm. and stuff like that some people having that normal reaction to scars mm-hmm. that it become their scar become extra bad than other people okay. maybe there are most, most of the people that having this kind of uh, of uh, high 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 percentage of having this post operative scars oh, okay and um, because we did have someone ask um they said that they had the blepharoplasty um a few months ago and they have really bad scarring and they asked um will this be permanent or will it should it reduce or is there anything you can advise okay first i cannot say it without evaluation like this but in general uh, scars can take up to 3 to 6 months to say it's already done mm-hmm. so during this 3 to 6 months we can um just use some kind of silicone based creams to the scar and uh, we can use as well the massage uh, even with you know this kind of facial moisture like moisturizer this thing okay. just massage it three times per day in this direction like it one two three with a little bit very tiny bit of a pressure we do this like about maybe three times per day later on like after sometimes it take up to one year okay. if after one year we find that uh, no no improvement we can either um even before that inject steroids or something called 5 fluorouracil like 5fu mm-hmm. or we can excite even the scar itself and re-stitch it again uh, and it will be better yet. and do you think um there's a difference like depending on who the surgeon is because someone did ask how do you choose a good surgeon and like how important is that um when choosing okay. La, to be honest if if the surgery is done well and the scar happened after Uh, it's not not a surgeon uh, not a surgeon thing like it's okay. a complication when no like discoloration like some people have discoloration after the skin so it's not a surgeon thing like the surgeon if he, he remove it well and stuff like this it's not a surgeon there other stuff could be a surgeon pro- uh, issue but I'll not say it now yeah <laughs> okay um we got a comment saying that you're a great surgeon so that's, that's good to know Dr. Khaldun is uh, is actually one of the best uh, doctors i doctor who uh, is smart enough is now in bristol he's doing his fellowship okay. he's one of the best written uh, doctors now in bristol <laughs> very good so what are the qualities that you'd look for if like if you are looking for a surgeon is there anything particular um that we should be looking for um for a surgeon mm-hmm. um uh, first of all um just let's talk about to be a surgeon what how like a football player what what you should be evaluated as a football player the mm-hmm. surgeon or like the doctor mm-hmm. so you have a very long training scheme in your life during this training scheme to pass it you have to pass a lot of exams and qualifications so one important thing of the surgeon uh, you are going to his qualifications it's not just a paper he just fight a lot and just have trained a lot examined a lot to get this thing so Uh, after all this test that he have been done this mean he's good in this but we cannot only rely on this of course the other thing um is his own uh, results like if you find that his own results and the patient like for example if somebody make 100 uh, blepharoplasty and it was good and one become having problem that considered to be like a good result anyway okay. so it's result of the, of the doctor that you go to and the qualification of this doctor as well That makes sense. Um, back to the blepharoplasty. Is there a, a particular age that you should be thinking of getting this treatment done? And can you be too old for the surgery? Someone asked me that. No, opinion. you can be only too young for the surgery. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's actually, we usually our patient of blepharoplasty um, who's doing it for uh, function reason mm-hmm. are probably elderly uh, people who have this problem that we say about this kind of field of vision and heaviness and dry eye. Mm-hmm. But uh, as long as it start to happen mm-hmm. and you are having issues about how it look like even no function you can do it no problem so maybe around 50 60 years old or 
Oh, yeah. It, it, yeah, usually people have, if somebody under severe stress in his life and become old, el elder than that, younger than that, like at 30 or something, mm -hmm. and started to have like a big, we can do it, no problem. Okay. There is not um, you kind of touched on this earlier. Um, I think I know the answer, but someone asked that when you're doing a blepharoplasty, would you be doing fat transfer or anything like that at the same time? Um, uh, uh, I yeah. think it was no, more to no. do with the lower, like I think maybe they were asking more to do with if you were doing like a lower eyelid um, blepharoplasty. Yeah, that's not so common to do, but like um, usually we remove the excess fat actually is the code of this appearance. So we remove yeah. more fat than putting more fat in this. This other, this is completely other, other, um, other story. We can do another, uh, another we Instagram. Can touch on that another, yeah, of course. <laughs> um, okay, and um, are there any side effects aside from scarring and discoloration with black like, let's, let's just put it like this: like any surgery, any maneuver will have side effects. So if even you are removing some hair from here, it can have some effect. So uh, it's the thing that how often this side effect happens. That doesn't mean we will not do it. Mm -hmm. Like if I say I have some risk of while crossing the road to be hit by a car, I have a risk. That doesn't mean I will stay at home all the day. Yeah. But there is side effects, of course, that it can side effect one of more of them. If you remove excessive skin, it can cause something called lag of salmus, like the eyelid doesn't close properly. And oh. if this happens, it can affect the cornea, become exposed always, even if you sleep, the eye will become not closed well. And this can make this cornea exposure, like corneal ulcers and dry eye and problems like this. Another thing, scar formation as well that we talked about, mm -hmm. and discoloration. And sometimes you can take asymmetry, like if you do it in both eyes, some asymmetry can happen in this. and. Um, and early can be bruises, sometimes the stitches, the hattens itself, like, and you have to stitch it again. But mainly it's a simple procedure, like it's not that kind of waiting. There is even more than that complication. But as I say, uh, you have complication of, of falling from the stair and break a cervical bone. Yeah, true. So, it's, um, it sounds pretty straightforward, the surgery, <laughs> as long as you're in good hands. Um, what I really want to talk to you about is what do you think about like people that travel abroad, say it's very common to go to Poland or um, Turkey to get this surgery done. Why is it so much cheaper? Um, are they cutting corners or is it just like... No, it, we don't take more money than doctors in Turkey, no. It's both. <laughs> <laughs> you no, don't have no, to it's tell it's me. Not, <laughs> I was, we were debating a lot about this question. Probably it's kind of something out of our hands uh, regarding the insurance and stuff like this. Okay. Uh, but this is not uh, the net profit for the doctor is the same everywhere or approximately. I mean, yeah. it just, I think it's kind of uh, even in the late year, like I was surprised by the prices uh, because I was doing with the same machines in my place, the same updated and everything and way different. But when I understand how much the insurance is, um, I understand now why it is, uh, it's too much, uh, uh, too much uh, difference in price. Okay, so but still, it's it it something good for both the patient and the doctor anyway, like on the other hand, it's, it's kind of a balance has to be uh, fixed. Yeah. Of course, from, from a dentist's point of view, like I definitely see that in, in other countries they do cut corners and a lot of the work they do is unethical, um, you know, prescribing crowns and veneers that don't really need to be done um so that's why i was wondering whether that you know relates to every aspect of medicine but because this is such a straightforward procedure do you think you know there's not much that they could be doing to cut corners here or uh, look if you are going to a good surgeon nobody will sacrifice the petition for uh, cheaper uh, stitches or uh, cheaper anesthesia or something you always give the best for the patient because it's still it's it's something, it's your work, like you can. Mm -hmm. So if you trust these doctors, or you know that it's well known that he is, uh, uh, no, you, you don't, you, as you, we said in the beginning, just go back, we'll go back yeah. to what we said before, that like, you should choose a doctor. Nobody have all this qualification and all this reputation. We'll cut it and get something cheap for uh, for just threatening it on reputation even. Mm -hmm. And then in terms of like flying and stuff after the surgery, is it probably not recommended or? Um, like that's another aspect, like if I... Uh, it's, it's a relative thing to be honest, like uh, we just like 
it's not an absolute like uh, contraindication like for example when we do uh, a, a, a retinal surgery and put gas in the eye that mm -hmm. no no fly whatever but if she's an urgent fly to something uh, no problem you can fly that it, like the pressure of the of the airplane will not do anything bad mm -hmm. um okay so we'll talk a little bit about the other aspect of your work which is like laser eye surgery um, what does that involve? Uh, again, do you recommend a particular age to get it done? Um, of, yeah, go on. Yeah, for the lady. Uh, for, for laser, yeah. Yeah, okay. So, because the laser is part of the, um, as we say, the refractive surgery, is mm -hmm. we, um, we do this surgery to make the patient get rid of the glasses and depend on her own eye only for the vision, for the best corrected vision. So we can do surgeries on the cornea, and there is a lot of surgeries. One of them is the LASIK, mm -hmm. and surgeries on the lens in the eye, and there is a lot of ideas to do on the lens of the eye. So we'll talk about the cornea and the LASIK part only. So the LASIK um, is just simply, you just get a flap, as you know, you are open the can of the uh, of the tuna can or something, you open a flap, very thin flap, mm -hmm. and just do a LASIK, this LASIK as if it sculpt the shape of a lens over your cornea, and you put the flap back again. So to do this, first of all, you should be uh, over 18 years old. Okay. For the tissue to be, uh, can withhold this kind of operation. Second, you should be at least one year, the uh, the eye is, uh, the prescription is fixed for one year at least. Mm -hmm. So it do so that makes sense because if you are still progressing, there's no point to do it today and do it tomorrow and do it after tomorrow, it just, when it's stable, whenever it's stable, we do it. The third thing is the corneal condition itself, because some people having a thin cornea. So, yeah, I mean, if it's a thin cornea, it's thin. You are sculpting in the cornea. Some people have something called keratoconus, mm -hmm. uh, which is the cornea is very thin, so it bulge like a cone of ice cream like this. So we don't recommend this. So as if, if you are over 18, you are stable, and you have to go to the doctor and do the investigation, your cornea is fine. You can do it, the, the LASIK anyway. Uh, as far as you are um, under 10 diopter or something, My, okay. minus 10 diopter. Okay, and are there like side effects with this that we should kind of talk about? Like dry eyes? The yeah. Mm -hmm. The side effect of the LASIK um, or the complication or the LASIK is safe, is, is like kind of complication, is 3% only or something like that, like 97% safe. Okay. So even though we're saying statistically, the um, the percentage of getting a blinding disease when you are sitting at home completely healthy, a completely healthy eye, mm -hmm. is more than the percentage of getting complication from LASIK. So it's considered to be safe procedure. Yeah, as we said before, any surgeries have it can have its own complication. So it can start from just dry eyes that can stay more than six months and need eye drops for this, mm -hmm. and uh, it can be overcorrected or undercorrected. So if it's undercorrected, you can have another uh, session to correctly correct it again. And um, there is other things that happen in most uh, any operation, but if you show the good place, like infection, like stuff like this, mm -hmm. if you show the good place, like you have a very, uh, very low, low uh, percent to have this problem. Okay. okay. Um, and if it's overcorrected, you just have amazing vision. And yeah, you should be beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds appealing. You wear eyeglasses again, unfortunately. So you mentioned the success rate for um, LASIK. Is there a percentage of success rate for like blepharoplasties, or is it just always, you know, success? Yeah, 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 uh, success rate. What, what do you define the success rate in blepharoplasty? Because success rate in LASIK is to uh, to keep the vision like... Uh, so like for the good. patient to be happy or for the eyelid to be, you know, completely... Yeah, like, more so patient, most patients are happy, like from my humble experience, Yanni. Yeah, and unless they have any issue that need to be corrected anyway. Okay. Uh, the final question I had here was uh, a bit irrelevant, but let's just answer it anyway. Someone said, um, can, you, can anything be done to correct uh, adiphthonic pupils? Adice pupil. Mm. Um, we don't know till now what is the code of adice pupil. To be honest, some people say it's viral infection. Even adice pupil, it's just all of, just for, for the audience who are not too about it. It's just all of a sudden the patient come for us in the emergency and say, At two days my eye only one of the eyes is big, like it's dilated. Mm -hmm. um, 
they say it might be we just do a very simple test we do just very diluted eye drops that constrict the pupil so it's like diluted maybe like uh, 10 times or something like this so after all these diluted, uh, diluted drops it constricts the eye so we know that this is a dye pupil but um, there is no specific treatment to be honest and it's not harmful yani. there's nothing bad to happen and most of the cases it go by itself yani. it's oh, not common itself. to escape. Yeah. Okay, it's not permanent. Okay, I'm going to look at the questions here. Sorry, my eyesight is not fantastic, so I'm going to be closer. Sorry, one more question. So, someone asked, uh, what tests, if any, need to be done before a blepharoplasty? Um, and if you were looking for, is there like a waiting list for a surgery date? Um, yeah, that's a good thing. Uh, some, first of all, like, I would like, if I'm suspecting the patient is a bleeder, uh, like he's on aspirin or something, I will stop this. And if I suspect he has low platelet something, I will prefer to do a test because it's not a severely bloody operation, but still, I will not, uh, I like always to be in the safe side if I'm going to inside or something like this. Mm -hmm. This number one. Number two, I think it's something for the, uh, uh, for the insurance and stuff with people under insurance, for the non-cosmotic blepharoplasty, we need to do visual field. Okay. So to see that the visual field are really affected to the extent that we need to do the blepharoplasty. Oh, but I think okay. it is kind of, it's not kind of the procedure itself, like it's kind of... Uh, so that they can get covered, party. yeah. Okay, yeah, cover. yeah. so if anyone has insurance and they're going for this surgery, they should just fail that test. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The algorithm of the test is very intelligent, as I will get that. All right. Okay. Um. Someone asked um like the price of the surgery, but I suppose that you're probably not the best person to ask about this, or what do you? Yeah, I'm not the best to ask about the prices. Okay. All right. Yeah. Uh, someone said, "Can you tell us some difficult operations?" I'm not 100 percent sure what they mean by this, but um. What the question again? Can tell us some difficult operations. So I mean, I I guess they're asking about. You know, any difficult. I, I, I think everything that you do is probably difficult. <laughs> uh, it's difficult. No, it's not a difficult operation, no. Like, there is more, like, cataract operation is much technically uh, higher in technique. Like, cataract is needed very high technicality, very long uh, learning curve. Mm -hmm. We are always learning still. Okay. Uh, corneal surgery is still. But, like, this is, I think, I assume it's for, uh, at least for me, it's easier than uh, cataract surgery. Okay referring everyone um okay any more questions um is surgery the only way to fix hooded or droopy eyes um i can answer this one actually because this is part of what i do in my day to day um you can get botox to lift hooded eyes it's quite successful uh the way to do it is by injecting the labella area and by injecting the eye area um, and using those muscles to because those muscles would normally make your eyes heavier um, so you put them to sleep which makes your eyes kind of open a little bit more i find the success rate is quite good for that one um, the only thing is that most people want to get botox in their forehead and that kind of reverses the effect of that. Um, I don't know, have you come across that? I really, no, I don't know this. Like, if, like, Botox in the forehead re reverses, yeah, that makes sense because the uh, frontal it can elevate the little bit. Mm -hmm. That's a really good take, Dr. Sam, a really good tool for, tip for me. Yeah, definitely. And what you find is that some people, um, they might, you know, put Botox here in the forehead, but not here. And then you have, like, that's how you end up getting, like, hyperactivity here and you get a spock brow which is not a very attractive look so what i Ooh. normally recommend if someone's trying botox to lift their brow is just leave the forehead out completely and just do the frown and the eyes um okay any more questions where in limerick you're in uhl isn't it yeah yeah um sorry if i missed this but i have sensitivity to light and tend to squint a lot would would that affect the healing uh time for the eyelid surgery so, I have. Sorry, yeah. say it again, to Dr. Sana. What the question is? Uh, so, she says that she has sensitivity to light and that she squints a lot. Would that affect the healing time for eyelid surgery? So maybe someone this who has like. Why it says make me need to go to the doctor for this symptoms? <laughs> like the, the eyelid is not an issue now. If you have sensitivity and you are squint, you need yeah. to be checked. Yes. <laughs> the island is not an issue now. Yeah. This is a bigger issue than the eye. That's the idea. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and would you get a lot of referrals from, like, you know, optometrists, like spec savers, and then would they refer people to to you as well, or is it is it? Blepharoplasty? No, just in general for like yeah, eye yeah, surgery. Yeah. Like, uh, like, uh, like what I like here to be honest, in Ireland, like in other places, doesn't have the. Um, the idea of having the optometry or, or opticians here, like it, it's very helpful and they are very well skilled and qualified. So they know, uh, most of them, of course, uh, they know um, a lot of the diagnosis and can refer it to the right person anyway. They, they are very good in this, most of them. Okay. Um, and what other doctors would you liaise with? Like, um, is there any other, like ENT or like, um, like plastic surgeons, would you have to liaise with them often, or do you kind of do your own your own thing? Uh, in which in which part in in which surgery or in which or the medical side, the med- you know, not because you know, like as as we were just believing, like say our my belief before that, like you're treating the 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 patient as a patient, not as an, a disease. Mm-hmm. So definitely, a lot of eye diseases is um, related or associated with a lot of medical conditions mm-hmm. like the very simple one is diabetes like um, diabetic eye people a lot of people have diabetic eye and we still keep injecting uh, 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 anti vegf and stuff like this inside the eye mm-hmm. as long as if they have like the doctor like um, uh, yeah, and treat them well with diabetes this indu- reduce a lot the number of injections that they might uh, need and a lot like rheumatological disease get stuff mm-hmm. like of course we are in contact with a lot of uh, it's all interconnected and this is our contact with dentists as well. yeah well yeah definitely diabetes is a big one for dentists because you get right. really really bad gum disease if not controlled yeah. but um yeah so i think that's all the questions thank you so much for joining thank us today Dr. Sandra, that was really, i was really an yeah, in interesting interview i'm very happy to be with you today good and guys you have to check out his page there's so much interesting information on it thank okay? you so much no thank you so much Dr. thank you so no much thank you now.